coordinators and perspectives of research and coordinators. And uh, we have been, uh, on behalf of the Indian Pollinator Initiative, we have been uh, organizing this since uh, early September this year. And this is the eighth talk in the series. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Dhammanti, Professor Dhammanti Bhushori from uh, Indonesia giving a talk today. So on behalf of the Indian Pollinator Initiative, uh, with the organizers, uh, Dr. Axel Brockman from the uh, National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, Bangalore, India, uh, Dr. Hema Somanathan from Indian Institute of Science Education Research, Tiruvannantapuram, Professor uh, Vasuki Bilavadi from University of Agriculture and Science, Professor Joby Joseph from Hyderabad Central University, and me, Parthi Basu from Calcutta University. We are pleased to uh, welcome you all. Uh, to uh, Damayanti's lecture today. Damayanti is a professor at the uh, Department of Plant Protection in the Faculty of Agriculture, Bogor Agriculture University uh, in Indonesia. And she holds the uh, position of chair of the Center for Transdisciplinary and Sustainability Science uh, at the uh, Bogor Agriculture University. Damayanti did her master's uh, from University of Illinois at Urbana. Uh, in US and also uh, did his uh, did a doctorate uh, from the biology department at Indiana University. Daman is an insect ecologist and evolutionary ecologist by training, and her research has uh, spanned from agricultural entomology, with of course special focus on biological control, integrated pest management, pollination ecology, to insect diversity and conservation particularly in relation to uh, transformed habitat and land use change. And she has been working on the interface of uh, agriculture conservation issues since uh, over the past two decades. And her passion in ecology has opened a wider area, much wider area of research in landscape ecology overall, uh, covering uh, different aspects of uh, human societies and its interface with ecological interactions. And over the past 10 years or so, her work has moved to the landscape approach, uh, focusing on biodiversity, pollination ecology, and more importantly, the public policy. And his current, her, her current interest includes science policy work and how they can be intertwined to produce evidence-based policy uh, in uh, conservation biology. So she has been doing a very important work, a uh, number of very important work, and uh, we all look forward to Damanthi's lecture today. And without much further ado, may I have uh, Professor Damanthi Buchori uh, initiate her talk today. You can uh, start sharing your presentation, Demi, and yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Partip, and um, thank you, Axel, and um, Dr. Vilavadi, and everyone who are here tonight. Well, for Indonesia, it's tonight. <laughs> um, it's it's a pleasure um, to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. So let me allow me to uh, share my PowerPoint. Okay, can you see my? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, yeah. okay. Perfect. Good. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so the title of today's talk is Land Use Change and Insect Pollinators Impact and Future tra Trajectory. Um, it, it took me a while to think um, what is it that I should uh, present because. Um, Sometimes you feel that everybody already knows so many things and you don't want to repeat yourself. So I'm trying to bring in um, hopefully something new into the uh, discussion today, but also highlighting some important, uh, important information that we should all um, realize. So this is a very famous picture. We all know how uh, how life without bees are bland and very, um, very boring um, and dangerous too. So 
this is when when we when we say that pollinators are important you always see this everywhere this it's um, people like to use this slide a lot and i thought it's also nice okay so actually pollinators are not just about the loss of the species there's this very good um review paper by stephanie chrisman um she wrote a very good review article um, and the title i put it up there do we realize the full impact of pollinator loss on other ecosystem services and the challenges for any restoration in terrestrial areas so she pointed out that um the bulk of research on pollinators is uh, mainly on entomological plant pollinator network related topics but actually if you really think in more detail and you think of the vastness of the impact of pollinators and pollinations and it's lost um, it's such a tremendous um, loss for the ecosystem for for the world and many many of those factors have not been studied um, so she put up this um, picture which I thought wow this is wonderful mm -hmm. the relationship between pollinator loss and of course the impact of climate change she called it the pollinator loss syndrome and um, what we see here with pollinator loss oh just a minute I have this cat that always comes to the table okay let me use the arrow Okay, so with this, um, do, do you see my arrow? Uh, no? no, not really. Okay, do you see it now? No? Oh, well, that's okay. okay. But doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so I think what uh, I want to stress here is that um, if we see the pollinator loss, yeah, we see the on the left side over here, um, the white rectangle, those are all related to the loss of ecosystem service because of, of the pollinator loss. Um, the high value crops, the medicinal mm -hmm. resource, um, erosion, um, genetic diversity, all of those are related with the pollinator loss. Um, and then the, there's an impact of the partial loss of the ecosystem services, and those are in the structured gray box right on the right, on the right side here. So the impact of that is um, the loss of income, uh, deterioration of health. It even affects migration, increased mud flow, social security, etc. And then it goes down, and you, you, when you go down, it can also result in um, decrease food um, food security or it causes food insecurity even war and oops are you still seeing it okay. uh, yeah we can see okay. it okay yeah. okay um so the pollinator loss what i like in this picture is that it um, she really connect the holistic aspect of pollinators into poverty at the regional and global level uh, and also at the uh, local level. So this is something that the network, yeah, uh, the association between pollinator loss, not only to health and to food security, but then also it can inflict war and poverty. So I thought that this is a very good um, picture to start out the discussion tonight, how pollinator loss can result in this uh, unprecedented loss to life. Okay, so this is called the pollinator loss syndrome. And here, um, usually as ecologists, we are just looking at the portion of um, the ecology, the taxonomy, etc. There is no really link. Um, well, with IP best, there's already starting link with um, policy, but people don't usually link that into uh, poverty, food insecurity, migration, etc. So, with that in mind, 
let us start looking at Indonesia. What is happening in Indonesia? Well, um, here's a picture of Indonesia. It has 17,000 island. And um, Angle in 2012 and late, later on uh, Kahono in 2018 mentioned that um, Southeast Asia exhibit the most diverse of honeybee today, both at the, at the species and below species level. There are seven um, native uh, apis in Indonesia. Well, six native. One is an exotic of apis mellifera. Uh, so that's quite a huge number um, that exists in the country. And then we also have 46 species of stingless bee from ten genera, and uh, you can see all those genera up there. And of course, when we, when we talk about pollinators, we are not just talking about the bees, but we're talking about a diverse array of um, pollinators, butterflies, beetles, flies, etc. In Indonesia, um, the research on pollinator itself did not really take off until about early 2000. And most of them are mostly on the population level, um, very rare on the taxonomy. There are very few taxonomies in Indonesia that is focusing on um, the bee diversity, although now it's getting more momentum. So the focus of to, tonight's uh, lecture, it will we will look at the wild pollinators. So I'm specifically just going to present data on the wild pollinators uh, and linking that to the pollinator loss and um, due because of land use change. What does the data say? What's happening globally? What's happening uh, locally? And then linking that to the future trajectory. What is it that we are expecting in the future? And how is it that we can sustain um, the futures and invoking the need for transdisciplinarity thinking? OK, first of all, deforestation in Indonesia. Sorry, this is still in Indonesian. But basically, what we can see here um, on the x-axis, we see the different uh, names of the island in Indonesia. There's Bali, there's Java. And then um, on the y-axis is the numbers of millions of hectares of um, forest. And um, these are the year. Yeah. So throughout the 1950, 85, 1997, and um, now 2007, et cetera, because usually it's every 10 years, one can see definitely deforestation is, is happening everywhere in the country. Um, and this is a very good uh, picture I got from a friend of mine to look at what's happening on the ground. This is uh, um, in the island of um, Sumatra in 1990. And one can see if, if I flip this, when this is still green and now it's already deforestated. And also here, another one, the blue one is the um, ocean. This is 1990 and 2000 one can see again. So it's creeping up to the highland, from the lowland to the highland. So if we look at land use change, in particularly in Indonesia, we can say that the majority of the drivers of the loss of pollinators are because of the land use change. Um, land use change causes habitat fragmentation. Um, and also reduction of the patch size and more isolation. So with land use change, you change the, the land cover and then you fragmented the habitat um, even smaller and smaller over the years. And then more isolation, uh, loss of connectivity, interpatch connectivity. So all these physical, biophysical changes brings about the changes in the interaction between the pollinators and the plants. Unfortunately, decline in plants and pollinators associated with land use are often only detected after several years. So um, then there's this lag time of what you can do because of the uh, loss that's already happened. And um, here, I think uh, also the, the stress that I would like to put down here is that the loss is not only on the species and the, its effect on the pollination and food, 
food loss, but also affecting the potential for evolutionary adaptations of pollinator and the plant species and their interaction. Um, this is all stated from the IP Best book. And another thing that is worth mentioning is the pollination network. We all know that the habitat loss or habitat degradation has a direct impact to plant diversity and to the pollinator diversity. But the increased fragmentation, the reduced patch size, the increased isolation does not only affect the plant diversity and pollinator diversity, but the pollinator movement. So the pollination network is being disrupted because of this fragmentation and increased isolation. And this direct uh, impact, we can, uh, to this direct impact, we can add the indirect effects of pollinator dependent reproductive success. So all of this network becomes even more um, confusing, yeah, because, and since we don't really understand the networks, the pollinator networks, um, the actual pollinator networks in, in, in nature, when we change something before we understand it, it can already be gone. So it becomes more, even more dangerous because we're losing something that we don't even know we had. Okay. Um, so now let, let us look at the data. What does this data say about habitat fragmentation? And here, okay, let, let me try to say, oh, I'm trying to pointer. I'm trying to look at the laser pointer. Okay, got it. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yes, I got it now. Right. Okay, so what does the data say about habitat from fragmentation? Well, we all know, we all understand that usually species numbers and densities um, are expected to, to decline if you have a less and less uh, air area, the species area relationship, you already know that. Um, now, uh, Rossi et al. in 2008, um, he did an interesting um, study on 22 force fragments, looking at the force fragments differing in size and trying to understand what is the effect of the different size of the fire fragments on species numbers. And lo and behold, he did not really find any strong effects on the bee community composition overall. However, when you look at the native stingless bee over here, you see a big effect. Um, stingless bee abundance is enhanced by the proportion of forested area in the surrounding landscape. And when it becomes smaller and smaller, you lose it. But the effect is different if you're talking about Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, because they will decrease with increasing forest area. So here we look at that different species have different response to habitat fragmentation. With native bee, um, is um, at a loss when you lose the habitat and the introduced honeybee seems they're just doing fine. And um, this is just a freshly um, data that my student did uh, and she just finished um, last month. Uh, it's being published right now. And basically what um, she did is looking at palm oil plantation. Okay, so this is a sketch of all palm plantation. And then um, developing different islands, if you might call, or different plots with different sizes, five meters times five, 20, 20, 10, 10, and 40, 40. And each plot or each island are being enriched with different types of plants. So there are different, as there are six different plants from forestry plants to fruit trees plants. And it's being uh, put in, in uh, different areas of the um, palm oil plantation. So basically, this is a, a research on trying to understand the biodiversity impact of enrichment uh, treatment in palm oil. We're trying to um, understand if there, we can develop an agroforestry for the future of, uh, of all palm. 
So this is the, um, the, the basis of the idea. Um, there are some area that are being planted with uh, six different plants and then the control plots, they don't have any, uh, they, they were not being added by the six um, plants, but the plots are still there, but it's just not enriched with the plants. So what do we see? If you look at this, it seems that um, species wise, there is no effect of the size of the plots, okay? Okay, one can say that, okay, the 40 times 40 is more than the five times five. So there's um, sort of like increasing, but it's not really clear from the data if we just look at the plot size. However, if we compare that with the vegetation type, it's clear that yes, the diversity of the vegetation will increase the species diversity of the um, pollinators. And in this respect, we are just looking at the uh, butterflies diversity. So these are not bees, these are just the butterflies diversity. Um, and then when we look at the abundance, okay, one might say mm, not really different. But again, when we compare that with the control plots, again, this shows how vegetational diversity has an impact toward the abundance and the species diversity. Um, okay, this is the same thing, but uh, more in graphs. Uh, what's happening at the species composition? This is the most interesting part. So even though the species diversity and the abundance may be plot size, doesn't really matter. When you look at the, at the composition, it does matter. So one can see that the the largest uh, plot, which has the largest vegetational diversity, is very different. The composition structure of the uh, butterflies are very different compared to um, the others. Um, so here we can say that species richness is not affected by area size, but affected by vegetation diversity. Species composition change with different plot size. And we can ask, is there a species disappearance? Is there a species turnover? What disappears uh, from one plot to another? Okay. Okay. So those are the habitat fragmentation. Um, now let us look at land use intensity. So when when we look at land use, uh, when uh, land use change, we can see from the fragmentation uh, part. Then we can also see from the factor of land use intensity. And this is a data taken from Klein, uh, who did her study in uh, Indonesia in Sulawesi. And by land use intensity, she looked at different uh, land use from near natural forest, extensive managed forest garden, uh, intensive managed garden, home gardens, intensive managed agroforestry, etc. So with uh, to the right, you have an increased land use intensity. Okay, so this is data for the solitary bees up there, and this is for the social bees down here. And here, we can see again the difference with social bee, with increasing land use intensity, you see a decrease of abundance and a decrease of species. So this is actually is what we have known uh, so far, that usually you have a decrease because of land use intensity. However, when you look at the solitary bee, you see a difference. It seems that the solid, solitary bee is not really affected by land use intensity. Um, and one of the arguments here is because the solitary bee can build um, nest everywhere. So they're not really affected by the land use intensity. However, for the number of individuals, you, you see actually an increase. So this is counter to what is uh, happening as um, social be. Um, okay. And then overall, um, I'm not going to dwell too much, but I'm just going to uh, let us look together um, at what is happening in other types of study. Winfrey studied bee visitation at four vegetable crops in relation to the land use intensity at local landscape scale. And the results were different that they did find, not find an association between bee visitation and land use intensity at any spatial scale. 
So the study indicates that both local habitat characteristic, that is habitat size or flower density, and regional <coughs> habitat heterogeneity could be more important factors than farming practices in influencing the diversity and abundance of pollinators. Um, in another study, Klein did another study still with coffee. Um, and she, she looked at the farming practices, organic and conventional, and regional land use intensity. Um, and she found out that there is no significant effect on bee visitation rate, co contrary to what was uh, at first thought. So these contradictory findings might be due to the fact that there was a great similarity between the organic and conventional farms in Sulawesi area where, she did, where they did their, their study. Um, so not only overall landscape heterogeneity plays an important role in promoting biodiversity in agricultural landscape, but also the spatial arrangement of high quality habitats, which can act as a source uh, of species. However, we can also see that only few studies have quantified the extent to which species disperse from high quality habitats to intensively use agricultural landscape. So for instance, in, in this type of landscape where we see many, many forests and then there's many um, habitat that's already being um, encroached and also um, intensively managed, um, there are not enough data on study that have quantified what is the extent that species can diverse, uh, can disperse, um, whether this is really a source going here is the sink and then go back and forth. So the pollination network, pollination movement, pollinator movement is not, has not really been extensively studied. So these are, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, trying to point out the gap of information of where more studies are needed. Um, okay, one of the interesting um, study that one can pursue in this diverse um, landscape is the changes of the landscape, for instance, like here in South Sumatra, there are Apis dorsata, the giant honeybees, that are still using the um, I don't know the English word for this tree, but in Indonesia, we call it the sialang tree. And these are basically the habitat for Apisterosata, which are getting more and more difficult to find because the landscape, the vastness of landscape, hundreds and thousands of hectares are being transformed into acacia, eucalyptus, or even oil palm. So this is a question that one could ask. What is the impact of this land use change to the foraging behavior of the Apis dorsata and for their growth? So the effect of landscape composition on large scale foraging routes are largely unknown. So again, this is an area where actually if we can collaborate, this will be a very interesting uh, issue, ecological research that we can pursue. Um, one of the questions that one could, can ask with respect to the habitat in Indonesia is actually about landscape complexity. Okay. Does landscape complexity and the existence of semi-natural habitat structure affect diversity of flower visiting insects in cucumber fields? So we pose this question because we look at the landscape structure in, in many areas in Indonesia. And even though in Sumatra, you see changes in landscape structure where you see monoculture everywhere, actually you can still see habitat that are still uh, have multiple cropping and then uh, open field, et cetera. So um, this posed a very interesting question on landscape. Does landscape complexity have an effect on diversity of pollinators or flower visiting uh, insects? Um, so, as I said earlier, the presence of insects in agricultural habitat is, is affected by the surrounding circumstances, such as the complexity and the structure of the landscape. And 
the landscape structure is often formed as a consequence of the fragmentation of the semi-natural habitat, which can negatively affect species richness and abundance of insects. So the aim of this study is to study the effect of complexity and structure on the diversity, abundance, and traits of flower visiting insects in cucumber. And we did a study on the 16 agricultural areas and we measured the different parameters of the landscape, the uh, class area of the trees, the numbers of patches of the trees and the agriculture areas, mean patch, uh, total edge, mean, mean shape index. And uh, we look at the different landscape structure on the a simple landscape and the complex landscape. So from the 16 agricultural areas, we divided into eight simple and eight complex. The results show that landscape complexity affected spacious richness over here. Yeah. So landscape structure does affect the spacious richness, but not the abundance of flower visiting insects, both for the mobile and less mobile insect. However, it does not affect the spacious richness of the apidae, of the apis. Um, flower visiting insects also responded differently to landscape structure. Species richness, abundance, and variation of body size were affected by the structure of semi-natural habitat. Okay, so these are the findings. So overall, the findings is that the most abundant flower visitors were less mobile, 80% individual and 28% of species. Landscape complexity positively affected species richness, but not its abundance and morphological trait of flower visiting insects. Um, species, richness of, uh, species richness and abundance of flower visiting insects were higher in landscapes with high proportion of semi-natural habitats. In conclusion, the study shows that the existence of semi-natural habitats surrounding farmland could facilitate the presence of flower visiting insects, including the insect pollinators, provided benefit for crop plants. So in Indonesia, you, if you come to Indonesia, you can see that the, our landscape, even though there are already many houses, many agricultural area, there are always those semi-natural habitats uh, interspersed in all those landscapes, and it does provide a very good habitat for the, for the um, pollinators. Okay, now we're moving on to the different land use type and pollinator communities. And here we're going to talk about different land cover um, in two different landscapes. So this is uh, a study done in Sumatra in two different landscapes, the National Park, uh, Bukit Dua Belas National Park. And this is the Harapan Forest um, in um, Jambi area. So these are very two similar landscapes, which has four different types of habitat. The Habitats are forest, jungle rubber, rubber, and all palm. So this is a study on land use type and trying to look at what the impact of uh, pollinators in this, uh, in, in this uh, specific study, looking at the butterfly communities, and then another study on flower visiting insect. So let us see what happens. Butterfly. Um, Again, looking at the species diversity, um, you see a decrease with uh, increase uh, in intensively used uh, habitat with rubber and all palm, uh, less species compared to forest and jungle rubber. And you see the same in both areas uh, in the uh, national park and also in the Harapan uh, uh, forest. Um, and these are the, um, the index, the diversity index, but I'm just going to focus on the species diversity and also on the abundance, uh, the numbers of individual. One can also see a decrease of the numbers of individual as well as the species diversity. Um, okay. And this is the species composition in the national park. Again, the same thing happening as what we've seen before, totally different species composition. So even though maybe the species diversity are a little bit 
change from forest to jungle rubber to oil palm. You know, I'm, we, we were surprised that we could see quite a lot numbers of butterflies in the oil palm. And this can be attributed to the fact that in oil palm, there's lots of understory vegetation flowering. So oil palm is not as, it's not as desert as one's thought in terms for butterflies, yeah? Because one can still see. However, if you see the species composition, it's totally different. So land use change definitely changes the species composition of all four types of habitat. And the same thing for the other landscape, the Harapan landscape. Also, the forest is always very different compared to the other type of land use, the jungle rubber, the oil palm, the rubbers. This is very different. Um, here, uh, this the difference here, uh, we can attribute it to the fact that Bukit Dua Belas National Park is, is a national park. So um, the uh, oil palm and also the jungle rubber, I, we think is still affected by the whole landscape the whole diversity in this landscape. So even though it's, it's very different, yeah, but there is no similarity between the oil palm and the rubber and the jungle rubber. Compare that here to the uh, Hutan Harapan forest, where this is more of a secondary forest. You see more um, habitat destruction over here. So you can see a clear difference between the forest and the, and the other uh, types of habitat. And this is just some beautiful pictures. The, uh, one can see the difference. There are species that are only present in the forest. There are species that are present in all land use types. So we were also looking at that. What are the generalists? What are the specialists? These are just only found the specialists, etc. Okay, the last part is this. Still looking at the uh, land use type, but looking at the flower visiting insects. And here we throw out the jungle rubber. So we're just looking at the forest, the rubber, and the oil palm. So again, looking at the flower visiting insect. So this is more or less of what you can see in, 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 the, in the field. This is the rubber, and it has many understories. And oil palm, it has many understories. And also, the oil palm itself, the, the, the plant itself, has many, many plants, many uh, parasitic plants growing. On, on the oil palm. Surprisingly, numbers of species. In the forest, we see very, very um, less species number in the forest compared to the rubber and to the oil palm. And we attributed this to the fact that there, are, there were more um, understory plants, flowering understory plants when we did our study. So many understory flowering plants in rubber or, and palm oil. And also this, this shows that, okay, so rubber and oil palm is not as depopulate as one thought. Um, and perhaps also maybe because um, the, the presence of the forest, you know, uh, what is the distance of the rubber plantation to the forest, it's you know it's not hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. It's maybe just you know twenty kilometers, thirty kilometers. So maybe there's still the spill over from the forest into the rubber and the oil palm. But however, in the forest itself, when we did our study, there were not many uh, flowering plants. It was the rainy season. There were not many flowering plants, and so maybe this is one explanation. So again, if you look at the species composition, one can see very different species composition from the forest compared to the two other habitats. Species composition of the secondary forest to the two habitats. So overall here, we're looking at the flower visiting insects where pollinators is within the, um, within this group. So we, we don't just look at the pollinators, but the overall flower visiting insects. This is just a cute picture. Um, again, looking at what are the species presence, species abs absence, who are the generalists, who are the specialists, and then looking also at the plant plants, uh, who are the generalists, so, uh, what are the types of plants that are always 
uh, present in all three habitat types. And then looking at the pollinator network, the pollination network in the different land use types. I mean, we haven't um, analyzed uh, the data for this. So this will be interesting to look at. Uh, does the pollution, uh, pollution and pollination network for rubber and oil palm is more complex compared to the forest. Now that is really, um, we need to be careful about what uh, data we are presenting here. But I thought this is interesting to, to share. So anyway, almost the end here. Overview of land use change and pollinators. Land use change, overall it causes a change in species composition. Is it taken over by generalists, loss of rare species? Result of species richness varies. Some studies show decreased species richness, some do not. Different responses dif depending on the type of pollinators and types of habitat. Landscape complexity and the presence of natural habitat plays an important role in maintaining the species existence. Pollinator network, still lacking data. Um, okay. Winfrey said this, land use change process are complex and pollinator responses might be conditioned by the type and extent of land use change. Pollinator responses vary according to study design, being largely negative in comparison across gradients in surrounding landscape cover and largely positive in comparison across local land use types. In addition, pollinator responses are more strongly negative in study systems that have already experienced extreme land use change and pollinators respond more consistently to changes in flood resources than they do changes in land use per se. This is our finding here. So it goes very nicely with uh, what Winfrey also found. Um, so floral resource may be a mechanism explaining some of the diversity of pollinator responses to land use change. Um, foraging behavior and land use type, for instance, the change of landscape of a vast area. We still lack data here. How far do the bees have to fly? Does it affect the pollen collection of the uh, pollinators? Does it affect of the nest survival? Because now we see more and more uh, apistrosata abandoning their nest, maybe because they cannot find and they have to, uh, they cannot find pollen. They have to fly more. So, what does the future hold? If we see the changes of land use like this, this is a wildlife reserve in South Sumatra, which we studied for over a um, period of um, how many years? Yeah. This was the forest in 1996, and you see the decrease, the decrease, the decrease, and the decrease. So what does the future hold for pollinators if land use is still rapidly decreasing, fragment, fragmented, isolated? So what is the future trajectory? Klein said in this paper, delivery of crop pollination service is an insufficient argument for wild pollinator conservation. I thought this is very nice. Be careful with the data that is available, whether it's a well-established, partial established, no evidence, etc. A strictly ecosystem service-based approach to conservation would not necessitate the conservation of threatened species. So that's why when I present you the data from the oil palm and the rubber, uh, please be careful in trying to understand what the, the data says, okay? So that's why I, I put that up here. Um, and this is actually a reiteration of what I said earlier, just to emphasize that uh, pollinators are key agents. The bulk of the research, again, we see that research is still into that. So we need to have a broad impact of pollinator loss coupled human natural system. We need to have more research in that aspect. Pollinator loss might cause simultaneous degradation of ecosystem services, inducing counterproductive human responses and interlinked poverty spirals. The interaction of climate change, a main risk of factors of poor pollinators and unadvised human responses to pollinator decline are rarely studied. The tipping points of pollinator loss are not yet identified. Can counterproductive human responses to pollinator deficiency upscale pollinator decline toward the pollinator loss syndrome? Chrisman argues for research on the impacts of pollinator loss and other ecosystem service useful and counterproductive human strategies on pollinator loss induced 
uh, loss induced degradation and the integration of pollinator protection into all terrestrial restoration efforts. For this to happen, I would argue here that we need to change our paradigm. Transdisciplinarity is the way for the future, especially if we look at this. We look at the Sialang trees that is more uh, that is ever more decreasing, with more of in in decreasing of uh, forest area encroachment of um, industrial area cities uh, agriculture areas. What will the future hold for Apis dorsata? Does research like the biodiversity enrichment experiment that we did in the oil palm, will it provide a solution for the future? Will monoculture like for eucalyptus and uh, oil palm and acacia, we need a policy to make it less monoculture and make it more into agroforestry type of um, plantation? Potts clearly stated there's a mismatch between the scientific evidence of impact and conservation and management responses. Since wild pollinators have limited radius activity, and according to Kohler, it only flies between 50 to 2,000 meters. I'm not sure whether this also um, affects the, um, uh, in, include the epistorsata. Pollinated protection depends on local management and action by hundreds of millions of local farmers and protagonists in nearly the entire terrestrial area of planet. Again, this is what we did in South Sumatra. Native pollinated and anthropogenic habitat, community participation in villages, working together with community, um, training on stingless bee, for instance, stingless bee identification, collection, bee collection, how to collect with non-destructive method, um, how to restore the habitat. It all needs the collaboration between the academia, local communities, local government, private sector. Knowledge co-creation is the path to the future. And this is what I mean by transdisciplinary. We have the empirical evidence. We need to go up to the purpose. And then we need to go up again to the normative because we have values as human beings. We need to have values to preserve the nature. So value, ethics, philosophy should be part of the whole research and education in pollinator and pollination. Transdisciplinary is a higher level synthesis. It is not your usual disciplinary, which is a silos, or multidisciplinary, which is additive, additive, or even interdisciplinary, which is interactive. It is more of a synthesis, a holistic approach of doing pollinator conservation in the future. Thank you to the Indian Pollinator Initiative, to friends, uh, and also to students. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dambanti. Uh, it's, it's an excellent presentation. You may now stop uh, sharing if you'd like to. Yes. Uh, Have I started? Uh, Have I finished sharing? No. Can uh, we may wait a bit till yeah? If, if someone asks a question and that uh, requires a particular slide, you can always ah, go back. Okay. Uh, so let me open this for uh, questions and discussions. I may have a couple of them, but uh, I would wait uh, for the others to ask first and then. Yeah. So open for question, please. Okay. So whoever wants to ask this question, you may re you may click on this uh, symbol uh, of the lower panel, raise your hand, and if you click, uh, I would know uh, who wants to ask a question. So please, uh, yeah. Right, so I can uh, see uh, I have Joby Joseph. Joby Joseph has a question. Joby Joseph is one of the co-organizers. Joby. You may ask your question. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, when you do the sampling, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. 
is it possible for us to sell uh, a palm tree growing in a, uh, a farm or a plantation uh, 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 as well as them usually growing in the forest for example can we compare the uh, the, the the well diversity of the same plant but growing growing into different ecosystem to get some okay. sense of the okay uh, i i lost you <clears throat> sorry i lost you a little bit because your your voice was um uh, was lost in the can, earlier could you repeat that again please yeah, yeah so is it possible for us to sample uh, the mm -hmm. same uh, species like either palm or rubber tree uh, mm -hmm. in their plantation compare it to if they are growing in the forest is it possible to sample the same the, tree? The, the species yeah same tree for the, species of if, yes if, if, if it's this, uh, the same species yes it's it's possible because yeah, when, I mean, when what, we what, what what is it uh, is it the ecosystem of the plantation or the ecosystem uh, that that's it's, making the difference for species richness you know yeah or it's, we, uh, it's what I, uh, okay thank you so we were sampling the ecosystem per se so um it's not the, the species itself but because of the ecosystem is being dominated by uh all palm versus the rubber versus the forest so if it's in the forest then you have a whole array of plants so we're looking at the different types of vegetation so different types of trees for the forest and um so these are the pollinators on uh, other plants uh, which are growing in the under those uh, trees uh, right yeah uh, or, um or am I, um, I maybe i did not understand yeah. properly yeah. for 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 the butterflies when you look at the uh, butterfly and the land use type between the four different land use type those were done because of fogging so we did fogging on the different types of ecosystem okay so yeah. when it's just a knockdown pyrethroid mm -hmm. and so we have a whole collection um but then for the uh, flower visiting for um uh, for the flower flower visiting insects we did that with a sweep net and also observation direct observation so again that's an ecosystem type of um sampling not the not the uh, okay, okay. plants itself, okay. but the the area, the whole area. No, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. whole area. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I have uh, Smitha Krishnan here. Smitha Krishnan would like to ask a question now. Smitha. Smitha. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Smitha. Yeah. You can ask. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. I, uh, I just wanted to know if you looked at only the understory or also the canopy for the pollinators. Mm, okay. Um, for the pollinators and for the flower visiting, we were only looking at the understory. We did not look at the canopy. Um, however, we did another study on that, uh, on that canopy, only I did not, uh, presented here and so, so, some of the data are, you know we have hundreds and thousands of um, specimens so uh, we, we choose on what we are looking at and at first when we did our canopy fogging we were more looking on the ants and the beetles etc so not on the pollinators itself but for the pollinators we were focusing more on the understory plants thank you do i see another raised hand yes uh Bilavari. dr Bilavari, you can ask now yes yeah uh, that was a wonderful talk uh i just have one uh, uh, question what was the difference in the species plant species diversity between your <clears throat> different locations did that okay. not affect the diversity of flower visitors yeah uh which um which part because i the, um 
I did a lot of study because these are different. Uh, so, so are you are you talking about the butterflies or are you looking at the flower visitors? Butterflies. I think he's talking about the butterflies. Even I had the question in mind. So yeah. you were showing two different kinds of data. On yes. Back to back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For, for for the butterflies, basically for for the butterflies, we did for for the. Um, are you asking for the fragmentation or the land use type? No, land species use. Conservation, land, 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 land use type. Okay. Land use type yeah. okay. So for, for the land use type, basically, those are the, um, well, the forest, the jungle rubber, the yeah. rubber, and then the uh, all palm. It's yeah. basically the dominant. The dominant mm -hmm. three species okay. are those. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, even though they're the dominant are those rubber and all palm, mm -hmm. you actually can see many, many types of understory mm -hmm. plants. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, because of the um, you know the sun, etc. So, um, I think when when we look at uh, plantations in Indonesia, one cannot disregard the mm -hmm. fact that there yeah. are all this vegetational diversity that has an impact. Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think this is right? yeah. This is and I think the this diversity. is. Yeah. This, this is interesting. I mean, compared to the temperate yeah. area, for instance, like in yeah. Europe, if you yeah. have grapeseed oil, yeah. or those are just same. yeah, populated. But I think India is the same with Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. 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 So, so yeah. I think we need to have a a different type of thinking. Yeah. Tropical think areas. Also, should be taken into consideration. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I thought that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, do I see any other anyone else raising hand except uh, the moderator himself? Uh, if uh, Sajesh has any question, yeah, Sajesh, you want to ask a question, right? I just had one question. Yes. So, uh, between the different uh, land use classes, for instance, you had uh, forests as well as you know uh, plantations, right? So, between these different land classes. Uh, and when you look at Apis dorsata, uh, did you notice any difference in how long they were staying in each uh, habitat? Okay, for Apis dorsata, I did not do the study yet, so okay. I don't have any data on Apis dorsata. However, since I have been working in the landscape for four years, I noticed that if you have even um, just remnants of patches of forest and if you have okay. three four five um um what say um the sialang tree mm -hmm. it can actually um you know it it, it really it, it is um, i i said this is not a research yet but this is my gut feeling okay so i may be wrong but my gut feeling is that it really depends on how large the area of um, acacia and eucalyptus are because mm -hmm. sometimes in acacia and eucalyptus sometimes they have what is called the hcv area high conservation value forest area mm -hmm. so if if those uh, monoculture are being interspersed with patches of forest then you see that the apistrosata stays okay but if you have you know if if, if you have acacia i think all palm is and I don't know if this is dangerous to say or not, because this is anecdotal, <laughs> anecdotal, yeah. and, and it seems that the epistorsata can get more pollen from the oil palm compared to the acacia, because okay. the acacia are being cut down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But again, this is not research. I don't have any data. Yeah. This is more of yeah. a gut feeling. Yeah, so yeah. don't quote me on that, <laughs> because yeah. it's dangerous. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's what what we see uh, anecdotally. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I have uh, someone uh, who's there in the YouTube uh, streaming. Uh, there are a couple of questions from there, and let me uh, read them out to you, uh, Demi. So, Dr. Avinash Chauhan has written, can the change in land use result in uh, establishing, I, I guess, re-establishing pollinator dominance? And uh, would it have... Uh, a, would these increase in pollinator dominance, I guess, through uh, changing the land use, can have fruitful uh, impact on present agriculture? So I guess the mm. question is, 
Is it possible to uh, change the pollinator uh, abundance, etc., richness by changing the uh, land use composition structure? Yeah. Yes. Can, yes. It, can it impact agriculture positively? That's the yeah. question. Well, um, definitely, yes, it can. Uh, it, it, it does have effect. And then um, whether it can affect positively to agriculture or not, I think it depends on the type of crops of, of the uh, agricultural crops, whether those are the ones that are being pollinated by the dominant, maybe, you know, Apis mellifera or Apis serana, or are they still needed, uh, pollinated by the wild pollinators? Because if the changes of the dominance is then being dominated by certain types of uh, pollinators that are only good for special crops, then it may not be good for all types of crops. So the, the, the answer is really, um, yes, it can. But again, it depends on, on the type of crops that you are um, working on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a uh, raised hand here. Gaurav Singh would like to ask a question. Yeah. Gaurav, you can ask. Hey, Anjanti, it's a nice presentation. So, I have, the first one is like how important those butterfly species are to the pollination of oil, palm, and rubber. Ah, and okay. How you actually differentiated the flower visitors from the pollinators? Yeah. Okay. The butterflies are not important at all for the all palm and the rubbers because the all palm are being pollinated by uh, beevil. Um, yeah. However, we see that because of the understory in the all palm, it can be a habitat for um, butterfly diversity it can, that can have an impact toward um, plants, the wild plants. So yeah. this is like counterintuitive that you have a all palm plantation that can be a habitat for pollinator that can have an impact to the wild plant. So it's like, okay, <laughs> you, you might expect the other way around, right? But in our, our research shows that, okay, they, they can harbor um, a, a set of diversity of uh, butterflies, even though at the less uh, diverse than the forest. Okay. Yeah, and one more question you mentioned about the, the landscape complexity, say for mm -hmm. a crop like mango I am working with, so, mm -hmm. so it's a monoculture, the stingless bees, they tend mm -hmm. to go to mango flowers, if even they find like something more interesting like a orchid nearby or say a olive tree, maybe just one tree between five mango trees, so they don't prefer mango. So I was wondering if like increasing the complexity, it have some extent of effect on the pollination of that particular crop. Yeah. Well, so that, the, yes. Yeah, they have more tendency of stingless bees visit over there. Mm -hmm. Like I'm talking my research in Australia, they have more tendency to visit when there is a monoculture and I see really good results. They spend more time on flowers and transfer the pollen but then is like complexity, different flying species nearby, oh. they just don't. Okay, so what, you, yeah. what you're finding is that with monoculture, you have more of a success of uh, yeah. pollination. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That may be yeah. an issue, like we definitely need complex systems for the conservation of our pollinators. That's but right. You say like mango complexity doesn't really work because it will just like Decrease success, yeah. at least in my my case. Yeah, you know, I, I think you've pointed out a very important um, issue here, that um, agriculture wise, it's good for agriculture. Yeah, but then we need to look at the you know what what would be the risk for the uh, wild plants out there. Yeah, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting. Thank you yeah. for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. If I may, I mean, to go off again. Yeah. So I just couldn't help. The thing is, of course, uh, Demi has answered to this. See, of course, so there is a suction effect. So it, it happens with even, you know, any mass flowering crop like mango you're talking about. 
mustard, for example. These are mass flowering crops. So obviously there is a suction effect, so it kind of sucks in all the uh, important pollinators in a given area. But that may impact the other uh, crops in the area as well. For example, other horticultural crops, which would require pollination, uh, would be kind of lost and limited during that particular period of time when there is a mm. mass flowering taking place. And mm. uh, thankfully for mango and for mustard, uh, mustard not quite, but it remains in flower for a long time, but ma mango, uh, the window is not uh, really large, so it's about a month at the most. Uh, but yeah, I guess, so it's kind of a little, little more complex than just mango. I mean, if you're you know, if you are really bothered about mango, then yes, it, it doesn't quite matter. But <laughs> but it does affect uh, the other uh, other horticultural crops in the area. Velavadi uh, has has a question, yeah, or, or a comment. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm just adding what you have just told to Gaurav only. Uh, I think we should look at when you are talking about landscape management. We have to look at the flowering phenology of different plants. Sure. What you are um, using, and there should not be competition for the target crop. So that's, that's how I think we have to plan the species that we are growing for landscape management, for conserving the pollinators in the off seasons when the, when the main crop is not in the flowering, so that you can keep the pollinators intact. So that is the, I think that should oh. be the... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Axel, Axel Brockman has a question. Uh, you can hear me now, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I have uh, two questions. So the first one is, why um, Zata and didn't talk about uh, Serana, Koshevnikovi, Nikotenka, Korea? I'm, I'm saying this because the first talk um, in our series from uh, Alisa Stewart um, from Thailand she had a, a pollinator network analysis in uh, Bangkok, and, and it showed that, that Serana and Florea actually uh, visited a, a broader variety of plants than Dosata. Mm. That uh, Dosata, I mean, okay, that's one data point, right? That might be a, more, a little bit more restricted. Mm -hmm. okay. um, why are you pointing out Dosata instead of the others? Um, Is it because you can see the colonies and by seeing the trees and that you don't, uh, there are less colonies? Yeah, well, it's it's because I've I I don't I haven't worked with uh, those two other spaces. Uh, Florea and uh, Karishnovki, it's so hard to say. Uh, my friends, uh, my uh, my friend from the biology department, they're working on that. But me, I'm more looking at the uh, complex of um, pollinators overall, not specifically on the species. And for me, why I'm talking about dorsata, it's because I'm fascinated by them. They're so huge and they're beautiful and, and there's a lot of local knowledge with uh, respect of Apis dorsata. So we have traditional knowledge where um, certain, uh, only certain type of, um, there, there are season to harvest. And then when you harvest, you have to do certain sort of rituals. Et so I have this fascination with the local knowledge in Apistor Sata. And whereas for the other two, I haven't really heard a lot. So I don't, I'm not really familiar with those two other species. Maybe that's why I did not say anything there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just wanted to kind of um, share that. Another thing is actually, I want to comment on this. Um, but NCBS, I mean, NCBS is not really integrated biology, molecular biology. But we have a wildlife master program. And, and the wildlife master program, is people are only looking at big mammals. Yeah, and kind of like what I say. Even, even the professors, if you ask them, I mean, insects are wildlife, they are kind of a little bit kind of, uh, yeah, or kind of like, oh, they're they not so fascinated. So, um, and, and, and the big topic uh, in this wildlife program is, for example, the effect of fragmentation 
on tiger movement yeah and on the, on the tiger population in india whether it's kind of so they are patches and whether, whether the tigers can move and whether you have um, uh, genetic inbreeding or so and i guess that there's similar happening with the elephants right because they also have these long movements uh, and what is fragmentation and uh, what uh, motorways right so the, because they are walking no one is ever actually i've never heard in the last year that one was asking what has fragmentation to do on your data which is migrating and for example particularly when we see it kind of like we know here in bangalore they are leaving during the monsoon so they have these monsoon migration unfortunately we don't know where they are going but it could be the connection between different kinds of flowering mm -hmm. So how to say, maybe because they are flying, they are not that much uh, kind of, but uh, kind of like, for example, if you say, so the idea is that um, um, they uh, probably travel in, in um, they jump. So they don't do one fly, but they mm -hmm. go two kilometers rest Rest, and then fly again, yeah. And and then um, so we have a, a study um, at one nesting site uh, here in Bangalore, and it's a, it, it's a basically a gated community with high-rise buildings, and and we observed them over two years, and actually um, one of the most interesting results uh, for me was um, of the colonies are only staying for two months. And so if you look, always one thinks about five, six months and then they swarm or something like that. No, it actually appears that the, uh, the, the majority is only staying a short time, which mm -hmm. might have something, what you said, with the flowering of a very rich uh, kind of like uh, uh, um, plant, like eucalyptus, and then they are kind of relocating their nests. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, so, and now if one is thinking of movement and fragmentation, maybe kind of like in cities or so, um, fragmentation can have an effect on the food resources, and that would make actually Apis Lausata relocate the nest more often than in kind of more natural habitats. And, and, and nest relocation is probably involved with costs because they have to give up the comb, then they have to build a new comb, for example. Right. So, so how do they say? So that is also could be it. I mean, I just wanted to say just by, by listening to your talk that these ideas came to me and, and, and that, that is kind of like there's two things among this migration of long, long way migration and um, fragmentation and mm -hmm. even nation or resources. Uh, so certainly they need more probably more food input uh, to keep their colonies alive. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No way, let's put it this way. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's very, very um, good input. Um, a friend of mine is going to study the migration of Apis dorsata, so she will be very much interested in your ID. Thank you so much. That's very great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Axel. I have one more. Uh, Kavya uh, has raised hand. Kavya, you, can you ask? It's uh, Sajish Kaya. Kavya. Kavya. Kavya, you can ask uh, the question. Hello. Hello. I think this would be the last question of the session, and there is a general sort of a question in the YouTube. But uh, let Kavya, we'll wait for Kavya for a minute, uh, for a few, few moments. Kavya, can you ask? I uh, see a problem. Well, uh, I have a quick couple. Point. couple Point. Of them, but Kavya, can you ask your question now? Yeah. There is a question, there is a question uh, by uh, Nirmal Raj, uh, who asks, uh, what is the most challenging issue in future that may affect pollinators? That's a general question. You may ask that 
uh, you may answer to that. Uh, some uh, Sweetie Nalwa has written from, if she's from Rajasthan in India, why butterflies are found more frequently in the urban areas? That's again a general question. Yeah, so there are two questions. Why butterflies are found more in urban? I am not too certain about that, but uh, is Deming to uh, answer that? Uh, yeah, so these two questions. But, but, Demi, if you, so these. The, the uh, second this, one? What's, what's the second sex, one? This, yeah, the, second the one. Is, she believes that uh, butterflies are found more in the urban areas. I mean, that's that's what she thinks. Our she urban area? What? Found in the urban, in the cities. In the oh, cities urban. Oh, urban. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. urban areas. Yes, urban. Okay. Well, okay. So for the, for the most challenging. Oh, that's hard. Because many. <laughs> well. That would be I'm, a I'm talk to... in itself. I can understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm going to answer in the context of Indonesia. Well, first of all, in Indonesia, I think one of the, um, well, the most challenging is because we're losing the habitat at a rapid rate. So um, how is it that we can conserve in the changing landscape? So um, we need to study to learn very quickly on the behavior uh, you know, like the migration and also a foraging behavior. So, so before they disappear, we need to understand more about them so that we can conserve and we know how to prevent them from disappearing. And then also the taxonomy. We have very, very limited number of taxonomies in Indonesia. And now people also are looking at the genetics. And I know two person I think is doing that but Indonesia is so huge and we have many islands as I mentioned earlier and who knows there are unidentified species in the, all those different islands so taxonomy is definitely a, a huge challenge. Um, for the second question on the urban areas I think not necessarily so maybe it's because um, in urban areas maybe you're living in an area where there are many flowering um, plants and you see butterflies and then you go into the forest maybe um, you don't see as much flowering at the time you were there so it's it's really anecdotal I don't think that you can compare uh, by saying that urban areas has has more um, um, butterflies because the data I think the data suggests that um, actually the forest has lots of butterflies yeah not the urban areas thanks Demi uh I had a confusion. So somewhere in your presentation, Demi, you said uh, that you know good quality habitats uh, like forests, it doesn't quite affect dispersal into agricultural habitat. I mean, in the sense that it doesn't really. What I understood uh, was you were trying to say that it doesn't matter if the agricultural area is close to a forest or not. Uh, uh, you know, but there are of course studies uh, that I know of. But they have shown that you know wild bee diversity is more in agricultural plots, which are closer to forest. Yep, yep. So this sounded a bit uh, contradictory. Yes, yes. We were surprised by our result. <laughs> yeah. We were scratching yeah. our heads. Is that okay? This is contradictory. And then one this of our, our yeah, yeah, one. The one of our, data in Indonesia has similar kind of you know that kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah, I know. So we we when we found this, we thought that maybe because there are many of these semi-natural habitats. Uh, so even though there's forest there, it doesn't really affect because the semi-natural habitat also has an influence on the agriculture area. Yeah. In yeah. that one particular study that we did. That's so right. again, it's, it's maybe it, it differs in different areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the same uh, sort, of, uh, sort of line, my second question is, so you're talking about semi-natural habitat. So, Essentially, you have looked at different habitats and wild palm forests, etc., compared the diversity. And you did mention about semi natural habitats in the uh, agricultural landscape. And because you are also into sort of pest management and biological pest control, etc., I'm just wondering if you have any uh, data on uh, the, uh, the multipurpose role of the semi natural habitats as host of natural predators as well as augmenting uh, pollinator diversity. Exactly. Yes, we have the refugia for refugia. the predator. Yeah. Yeah. Refugia. So have yeah. you any 
you done any work on uh, yes, that aspect we, we of Indonesia, which is pretty heterogeneous, as you said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we yeah. do have some data on that, and it, it has been shown that it really has an impact on the um, pest control of the agriculture yeah. area. So that's why we need to yeah, maintain yeah, that. Yeah. That's a very, very important uh, mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. My last question is, of course, I mean, you really uh, you know, hit the uh, bullseye when you said that we have to go out of your go out of our silos and uh, you know reach out to you know different disciplines and cross talk uh, so obviously that's the way to go that's the way forward but but it's hard <laughs> yeah it's hard much much hard. Hard, you know, what can you imagine you know it, even within the same discipline we do not cross talk often yeah so, right but so uh, have you how any, can it be done? How can it be done? How can it be done? That is one. And uh, so what do you think are the farmers' perception? Can social scientists come out and uh, you know, inform uh, about the farmers' perception? What's their, you know, how can pollinator conservation uh, be an agenda in their planning, et cetera, or their agronomic uh, sort of, uh, whatever, agronomic mm -hmm. management practice? So, mm -hmm. have you any data? My first question is: Have you any data about farmers' perception about the role of pollinators in agriculture, or you know other areas of message? So that is one. And secondly, how, if you know, how can that be incorporated into agriculture planning? Mm. Okay, the As first one. Yeah. yeah, we have data, but not on the farmers' perception, uh, but on the perception of the beekeepers. So we're doing a vast uh, study on beekeepers across Indonesia and what is their perception on the po pollinator decline? Do they see pollinator declines based on their experience? On the farmers per se, we do have anecdotal data, but not really vast research but uh, when we did our study in that area, then we will ask also the farmers of what their um, perception about the other day, are, are they using pesticides and what is the impact? So uh, on a smaller version, we, we do have, but not, not as fast as the um, uh, beekeeper's data. So that's for the first one. The second question, what was the second question? Yeah, I mean, uh, how can uh, pollinator conservation, pollinator uh, management uh -huh. uh, sort of, be made a part of the public policy. Uh, I mean, what's the public okay. policy engagement? You're talking hmm. about in, in Indonesia, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I have a very good case study on this. One day, the Ministry of um, Agriculture um, hand out to many farmers um, a, a net. A net, so they said this net should be used so you will your crop will not be attacked by uh, pests. So then the farmers use the net and then they complain. They said they don't, uh, they, they don't have any um, harvest. Of course, because they're putting the nets and the pollinators didn't come in. So that was a very good anecdotal evidence for the policymaker to, uh, for them to understand, ah, okay, so we do need the pollinators. That's interesting. So, uh, so we have that case study that we, we have always used to um, discuss this with, with our um, government. However, I, as Axel said earlier, you know, it's hard to talk about pollinator uh, policy because they're just, I don't know. It doesn't it's, exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah, it's too small. People don't believe that they exist. And I said, so yeah, public uh, education is badly needed yeah, yeah badly yeah. needed uh, okay thanks uh, that too yeah kavya wanted to ask a question and which she couldn't i uh, she has raised her hand again kavya can you can you hear hear us can you ask your question now kavya yeah. uh okay uh, so yeah uh, i should speak with Sajesh. my audio is not working all right yeah okay. okay all right all right okay i understand that so, uh, Shanchari has a question. There's a last question. You can ask it quickly, Shanchari, and yeah. Uh, okay, can I ask my question? Yeah, please ask your question, Kavya. Oh, I thought you were not asking. Okay, sorry. Yeah, oh, please go okay. ahead. 
okay uh, so um, there was this uh, graph with uh, number of solitary bees across uh, intensity of land use mm -hmm. uh, where solitary bees uh, there was an increase in solitary bees with uh, uh, increase in intensity of land use. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it had also a decrease in uh, social bees mm -hmm. uh, so this was the same experiment it's the same experiment it's a different responses of the different types of insects so that's again it shows how different species respond differently to land use intensity for solitary bees they don't care you know because they can make nests everywhere uh, in fact they have more places for nesting and with more land use intensity for solitary bees but the other way around for the social bees uh, they are so this was the same plot as well right uh, data collection the same yeah it's it's in, in the same area but not the same plots but the same oh, area no i was wondering if this is related to decreasing social bees like uh, because of decrease in competition that's what I was thinking. Ah, okay. Well, that that was um, that was mentioned. That was uh, one of the argument that was taken into account is that maybe there's a competition there, uh, but it's we're not sure. It's yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, Hang on, uh, you have to be unmuted. Sajish, can you unmute Sanchari? So, moderator, can you unmute this participant? Sanchari, can Yeah, hello, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yes. you are. Yes, so my question was in the uh, same area that uh, Kavya was asking just now. I was wondering about that competition issue, whether, is, uh, whether there was any competition regarding this uh, contradictory results of social and uh, solitary bees. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that I was thinking, uh, whether uh, since it has been seen that there is an increase in the uh, so, uh, solitary bees, so has there been any data that which kind of uh, uh, dwellers are getting more uh, you know, increased? Like, because they are, they can, as you said, they can nest in so many other areas. So mm -hmm. it's an advantage for them, uh, probably mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, rather than having a social um, aspect. So uh, is there an increase in particularly soil dwellers or twig mm -hmm. nesters or ha has there been any data of such kind? Yeah. Well, un unfortunately, those studies did not continue. So when the project ended, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah okay. it, it's, it's not followed so yeah we, we don't have further data for that but for the competition yeah i think that's a very that's a valid argument and as i said uh, earlier we we recognize that also as one of the possibility yeah. thank, thank you. you thank you very much you. and i guess with this question i think we have really kept uh damanti uh here for over an hour about one and a, hour and a half now and Thank you very much for being here thank with you. us today. Yeah, and uh, thanks to all the uh, participants here who uh, have gathered here. And uh, with this, may I draw this session to close today. Uh, and thanks again, Damanti. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.